Good morning and welcome to worship with University United Methodist Church on this third Sunday after Pentecost, on this third Sunday of our series, Tending Your Whole Being, the Gospel and Mental Health. I invite you to make yourself at home, make yourself comfortable, light a candle if you have one. Prepare your gifts and offerings if you mail them in that they might be blessed or even consider giving online while we worship. Sit back, relax, and invite the spirit to move in you so that you know that you belong, believe, and can be love in this space. Please join me in our call to worship. Even in the wilderness of life, God is faithful and equips with the spirit for endurance. When temptation presents itself, O Lord, we focus on your steadfast love and grace for endurance. Jesus invites all who are struggling and carrying heavy burdens to come to him for rest. In the midst of our weariness, may we yoke ourselves to Christ for spiritual strength and soulful rest. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, 
Good morning, friends. It's Miss Tiffany. I am so happy to be here with you. You know, I'm thinking we're not going to have too many of these chats through YouTube left because we're getting ready to go back into the sanctuary in August. I am so excited to do children's time in person soon. Well, today we're going to talk about something that is a little hard to talk about. This is kind of a tough topic. So I know we usually like to have a lot of fun during children's time and I tell funny stories and we sing songs. Today is not that day and I am so sorry, <laughs> but I am gonna try to make it a little interesting for you. So we're gonna start with a story about Miss Tiffany when she was little. Um, you're gonna see some pictures coming up on the screen and those are me, that little baby Miss Tiffany. You will see something in every single one of those pictures that is the same. That is my pacifier. When I was little, I had a pacifier and you have probably seen a pacifier, you know, with babies before, maybe your brother or sister had one, maybe you had one. Well, I had my pacifier until I was three years old. And you're probably thinking, Miss Tiffany, that's a little long to have a pacifier. And you are right. It was a little long to have a pacifier. Today, we're talking about habits that start out as helpful pacifier is helpful to a baby when they're very little because it can help them calm themselves down if mom or dad is busy and as you get older you probably use it less and less well by the time I was three I was only using it at home but it was gonna start getting in the way of things you know by the time you're three you can talk a fair bit and I had to talk around my pacifier that was challenging but it was really time for me to say goodbye to my pacifier. I didn't really need it anymore at three. And so sometimes those habits that start out as helpful can start to get in the way of things as we get older. Well, one day I, I had a toy that I wanted and my mom said, Tiffany, you can only have this if you get rid of your pacifier. And I thought about it and I went over to the trash can and I dropped my pacifier in the trash can. And that was the end of Miss Tiffany having a pacifier. So we could say that I quit cold turkey and I never had a pacifier again. Well, sometimes people have habits, things that they start out doing that are helpful to them, that then start to not be helpful and they can't just go to the trash can and throw it away. They can't just walk away from that thing. Their brain and their body are telling them that they need that thing to survive, that they cannot function without that thing. We call that addiction. And it can be very, very scary. It can be very scary for the person who is stuck in that place where their body tells them that they need that thing and that their brain tells them they can't live without it. It can be very scary for the people around them. That person may not act like themselves anymore. They might start having behaviors that are harmful to themselves and to the people around them. And that's very, very scary. And we can be tempted to think that that person who is in their addiction, who is doing that bad habit, is a bad person. And you know what, friends, they are not bad people. They are having a bad behavior. But that does not mean they are bad people. It means there is something going wrong in their brain and that they need help. And God tells us that nothing will separate us from his love, that he loves us no matter what, even when we have bad behaviors. And Jesus tells us that when we are stuck, when we have things that are really heavy to carry, when we have burdens that we can't escape, that he can help take those. Now, there are a lot of resources for people who have addictions. And if you know someone, or you think you know someone who maybe has a bad behavior that seems scary to you, and you don't know what to do about that, I wanna encourage you to go talk to a parent. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to a parent, go talk to another adult that you trust. And that can be me or Miss Melissa or a teacher or Pastor Kathy or any other adult that you trust. And those adults will do our very, very best to help you with that situation. But we want you to remember that those people are not bad people, that we love them and Jesus loves them. And there is always help available. 
All right, friends, I know this was kind of heavy. Let's start, um, well, actually we're gonna end with a prayer and then um, have a really great day, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for taking our burdens that we cannot carry. Help us to remember that all people, no matter how badly they behave, are still good people that you love and that there is always help. Help us to love and help others as you love and help us. And all God's kids said, amen. All right, friends, I'll see you real soon. Have a great day. And now let us go before the Lord our God in prayer. God of love and mercy, we thank you this day for the beauty of the morning, for the sun which beams your light, warming our skin, reminding us of your Holy Spirit's presence. We give you thanks for the flowers and birds that remind me, that remind us of your continual promise of new life and for the many sounds that remind us that we are not the center of the universe, but a part of the many ways in which you work in this world. Gather us in, into your spirit, into your grace, into your loving arms, which embrace us in light and love, even when all we can see is darkness and despair. Be the hope we need to see in the world. Equip us to be the hope for those around us, to be bearers of your light and love in all places and for all people. We sing praises of glory for those who have celebrated great accomplishments this week, promotions and graduations, celebrations, vacations, and we weep and we mourn with those who struggle with the loss of loved ones, loss of hope, and loss of future dreams. Be the rock upon which we hang our trust and faith, remembering that your spirit is with us always to guide us and to give us hope. We pray for your healing for those in our University UMC family. We pray for Kelly Babcock, who is convalescing at home after her surgery, and for Betsy Leth, who is recovering at home from a fall. We continue to pray for Vil Callicton, Bonnie Wright, Ann Ownby, Laverna Price, Barbara Albers, and Lois McKissick. And we pray for those close to our hearts who are in need of your healing and loving touch. We pray for all who grieve. We pray for those who have been homebound long before the stay-at-home orders. We pray for Muriel and for Jan. And living into your hope of promise, we dedicate ourselves our lives and our offerings to you that they might be multiplied for your good purposes in the world in our church's work and mission by the power of your Holy Spirit. And at this time, we gain strength and unity as siblings in Christ as we pray aloud the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 
Now listen for the word of God. No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have shown them to babies. Indeed, Father, this brings you happiness. My Father has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Father, and nobody knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. I remember the moment vividly where I was seated, seated, the people surrounding the table at the meeting where I sat off campus that I did not drive to. The immediate trepidation, whether to carry on or to disrupt the meeting and abruptly leave. A text had come through on my cell phone, short but impactful. Sorry to tell you this way, but, and I'll call him Johnny, but Johnny is in the hospital from an overdose. He is critical. Please pray. Wrestling with shock and processing this news, the voices of the clergy around me muffled into those of Charlie Brown's parents. And within a minute or two, I knew I had to leave. Thankfully, Pastor Brandon was gracious enough to drive me back to church because we had carpooled that day. Now the blur of those moments extended over the next four days as we sat vigil with Johnny at the hospital praying for a miracle. A motley crew, this large extended family of which I was fully a part, though not by blood. You see, his mother Sophie and I lived together when we were pregnant, and she is like a sister to me. And four years later, when she was pregnant and had Johnny, he became like an, another nephew to me. Now the waiting room was filled with stories of Johnny's life, stories that spanned his 26 years. There was laughter, there were tears. He was a remarkable young man, filled with joy and compassion and love. He made any room light up just by walking in and flashing his smile and the dimples that were oh so lovable. He was kind, he cared deeply, and was deeply cared for. Devastation doesn't even begin to cover the feelings in the room when the doctor informed his parents that he would not survive. This world would not be the same 
without his presence. Despite his loving demeanor, Johnny faced tragedy in his lifetime, tragedy and trauma that felt too heavy a burden for him to carry on his own. He started off taking prescription medication to ease the pain of his soul, not under the care of a doctor. And when his beloved bonus dad died just five months earlier, his pain became overwhelming. It was greater than he could bear, and his quest for relief by substance expanded even wider. This is how addiction works. You see, nobody wakes up hoping to become addicted to substances. Nobody wants to end up in a hospital room surrounded by tearful friends and family members. It often begins with the presence of pain, emotional or physical, pain which is temporarily alleviated by substances. Now, when use triggers addiction, the ability to evaluate the situation diminishes And the power of addiction casts a shadow over the individual's ability to discern their own identity and to enact their own freedom to make choices that they might otherwise choose to do. Now, Dr. Gerald G. May, medical doctor and author of Addiction and Grace, this book right here. He defines addiction as any compulsive habitual behavior that limits freedom of human desire. And he describes five essential characteristics that mark true addiction. First is the building up of tolerance, always needing or wanting more. The second is that it has symptoms of withdrawal, and this ranges from mild irritability to extreme agitation or rapid pulse or tremors or overwhelming panic or physical withdrawals. The third is self-deception. The brain's creative power to subvert any attempt to control the addiction, and this includes denial rationalization, displacement, and every defense mechanism out there. All of these self-deceptions have a corrosive effect upon one's self-esteem. Now, the fourth characteristic is a loss of willpower, a loss of being able to choose what you want because you have split desires, a desire to chase after that which you are addicted to, and a desire to be free of said addiction. And the fifth characteristic is a distortion of attention, one that profoundly hinders our freedom to choose and our capacity to experience love. Now, substance abuse is connected to a desire to alleviate pain and is often referred to as self-medicating. You see, half of the people who undergo treatment for substance use disorders also have a diagnosed mental health condition. This is called dual diagnosis because addiction or substance use disorder is itself a diagnosable mental health condition. Now, half of all people with one have the other, and this is greater in young people. You see, 60% of adolescents being treated for substance use disorders also have a mental health condition. And this should tell us something important. First, the stigma about mental health needs to be eliminated so that we can identify and properly treat conditions early on before individuals begin self-medicating. Second, 
The stigma about drug addiction also needs to be eliminated. It is not just some frivolous act of partying in a carefree way. And as we talked last week about language, this week it is important for us to look at that too. For example, the term junkie is often used to describe someone who is addicted to drugs, especially someone addicted to heroin. Now, this term is derogatory and is incredibly harmful. It literally refers to a person as being junk, trash, disposable, something that gets tossed into a dumpster and thrown away. People are not junk. Even someone whose addiction has taken them to rock bottom and they don't see their own value, this person has incredible value. They are still a person created in God's own image. When we refer to people as junkies, we are essentially trashing God's divine image in another person. We are also diminishing the personhood and defining them by their circumstances. As individuals and especially as Christians, we should be we would be well to focus on person-centered language in all that we do, respecting the dignity, worth, and unique qualities and strengths of each and every individual. This is why we talk about people who experience addiction rather than addicts or people who experience mental illness rather than the mentally ill or people who experience homelessness rather than homeless people. We want to place the person first and their circumstances second. Now, addiction to substances, whether it's alcohol or drugs or tobacco, is, it's linked to a more lethal outcome than other addictions. The CDC reports that over 70,000 deaths occurred in the United States in 2019 due to substance use. 2019 is the year Johnny died. He was one of these 70,000. This is not just an abstract big number. These are people. The numbers have only increased since the pandemic. Now, of all the deaths by overdose, more than 70% involved opioids, a reality that desperately needs to be addressed and resolved. Now, lest we fall into the trap of categorizing those who experience drug addiction as those who are less than or maybe unlucky or worth less than others, we need to acknowledge that addiction comes in many, many forms. My personal struggle with addiction is with food. While it is less lethal, it is still complicated, emotionally damaging, and filled with shame. And the unique thing about food is you can never just kick the food habit. You still need to eat. I have yo-yoed in weight since I was a young child. My journey has been long, and I thank God for therapists and for psychological tools like Noom that have helped me to restore a healthy relationship with food and overcome my addiction to it. Substance abuse includes everything from illicit drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, tobacco, food, or more specifically, sugar, and caffeine. Caffeine. We don't negatively judge those with a Starbucks habit, do we? Yet it is the same power of addiction 
that entraps each individual facing addiction. There are also behavioral addictions, and we might judge those that are gambling or sex addictions, but there are several others we might have and even maybe justify as being better or even good, productive. Addiction to work, exercise or dieting, neatness, punctuality, or relationships. Maybe we're addicted to social media, to a sense of popularity, or to status. The list of things to which we can be addicted is lengthy. Now, being addicted to anything means that it becomes the pinnacle of our attention and desire, breaking down our ability to be in healthy relationship with anything and anyone else. In this way, addiction resembles idolatry. Dr. May writes that in our culture, there are three gods we trust for security. These are possessions, power, and human relationships. And he says, to a greater or lesser extent, all of us worship this false trinity. He also points out that true addictions are compulsive habit, habitual behaviors that eclipse our concern for God and compromise our freedom. He says that grace is the only way we can break free from the bondage of addiction. It is not something we can do on our own power. Now, maybe that sounds familiar to you. You see, the 12-step recovery programs are rooted in this same truth, the truth that addiction is beyond the individual control. The first of the three steps are, one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol or whatever else we are addicted to, that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. That is grace. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. And this is humility and submission. As Christians, we turn our lives over to God in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. We recognize that God created us in God's own image, yet we are not yet perfected in this life. We face temptation. And we remember that we are not alone in this experience. Our Lord Jesus Christ was God incarnate, God in human form. And Jesus faced temptation as well. While we don't have the benefit of being fully divine, we do have an example in Christ of how to center ourselves so firmly in God's spirit, responding to temptation with scripture when our own words fall short, and they often do, and keeping ourselves humble and seeking God. Now, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that God is faithful. God won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, God will supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Friends, there is no easy button when facing temptation. It will be hard. But God does not test us intentionally to see how far God can push us. But when we are tested in this life, God is with us. And when we receive the grace of God bestowed upon us, whether we know it or not, we can then humble ourselves and submit to the power of God's love and grace, which can help us to overcome the temptations of this life. And in our gospel reading, Jesus asks those who are struggling hard 
and carrying heavy loads to come to him. And he promises to give them rest. Jesus promises you rest. Jesus promises us rest, saying, I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. Friends, it takes a village. It takes gentleness and humility to grow together in love for God and love for neighbor. It takes intentionality to break down the barriers of stigma and address the temptations and addictions we all face. It takes generosity, knowing that some of us have had more resources than others and have had more help to escape the things that cause us temptation and to be gracious to those whose lives continually struggle in and out of addiction. It takes knowing that we cannot do it alone. We cannot face temptations and overcome the power of addiction in our lives alone. And we cannot judge others, those who face addiction and substance use disorders, even when they cause us great pain by their actions. We can acknowledge our experiences of frustration and vent to God and vent to those with whom we face this challenge, those who partner with us in that. Yet let us do so by tending our loved one's whole being, knowing that they and we are not the sum of our circumstance. We and they are not the addiction which enslaves their behaviors. Let us commit to tending our whole being, looking to Christ as the perfecter of our faith and humbly following him. Let us commit to breaking down the stigma about addiction and reaching out when we need help, knowing that this is brave and is not a sign of our weakness. And let us reach out when someone we know needs help. There is help. Interventions can be had. And let us know that rock bottom is not a place of shame, but a place where God's grace can meet us and transform us and not leave us there. God loves you and wants wholeness in your being, your whole self. God loves and wants this for us all. Thanks be to God for amazing and enduring grace and love. Amen. Now our own Marianne Fitzpatrick has some words for us this morning. Let us listen. When Pastor Kathy asked me to be a part of this mental health series and sharing my thoughts about addiction, I was just so pleased that she was willing to bring up this topic and that our church is going to have been addressing it as it is such a a gigantic need in our day and time right now. Now, when we talk about addiction, let's first address addiction. And the bottom line is that addiction is any compulsive behavior that is a need and a use and abuse of habit-forming drugs and habit-forming substances, I should say. And those substances are alcohol, prescription drugs, and drugs generally. Now, they have also developed some treatments for behavioral addictions. And behavioral addictions would be to gambling and food and some other things. So let's think about this. Since the pandemic, what has happened to addiction? It's increased. 
And why is it increased? Because of loneliness, isolation, helplessness, and just irrational fears. And so what do we do when that happens? We form false beliefs, false beliefs that cause us mental pain. And these false beliefs are formed from traumas and traumas are defined as distressing, very distressing and disturbing experiences that we have had in our lifetime. Now we've all had that, but some are so extreme and so disturbing that they affect us so deeply that there is a, a mental challenge to that. Now, there are a variety of addictive behaviors that are used to stop this mental pain that happens from the feelings that come up during these thoughts of the trauma. My earliest and most formative experience was with my father who was an alcoholic. He was in the Navy and he was on a ship that was next to the ship that was bombed during Pearl Harbor day. Now he never wanted to talk about it. And the only thing he ever said was that he saw the Japanese planes coming over and he thought they were male they were our planes with mail with letters from my mom. Now, my dad died at 59. And many years, bef many years before we began to understand and treat traumas, way before PTSD was even recognized, it took it happened, what, in 1980 that PTSD was recognized in the Diagnostic mental of, Manual of Mental Health. So I don't know if my father's alcoholism was because of this, but it sure helped me make sense of my chaotic childhood. A psychologist that I had listened to as I was preparing for looking at addiction, he has treated, studied, and worked with addicts. And he says the most prominent, dominant aspect uh, and factor of addiction and many other mental health issues is past trauma. And when we have trauma, we have suffering. And he says that suffering is what causes us to want to stop it, suffering of mental pain. And everyone wants to stop pain, don't they? Whether it's mental or physical. So to cope with, with the addiction, they are trying to block out the fears, the false beliefs, the negative thoughts about themselves and the world. And as you look out into the world today, you are seeing many results of mental illness and our behaviors in the world. In my earliest, uh, excuse me, it is important as a church family to reach out to those who do not have the ability to reach out themselves for help. And let us remember that one of God's commandments is to love each other as God has loved us. And I absolutely know that this church family is very, very loving. I am a retired licensed professional counselor that had a private practice for many years. And I left it to go into the ministry from which I have now also retired. However, I have combined my experiences of ministry and counseling and therapy into what I call spiritual mentoring. 
I do this by phone. And I want, I just want you to know that if there is anyone that might benefit from this work with me, please call. I can be, I can be located through the church and I'm also in the church phone directory as well. So in closing, let's remember that it is important for each individual to number one, to, to what? To believe that they are a precious child of God, to feel that they belong, and to know that they are loved and lovable. So thank you for listening and God bless.
And now for some announcements. Of course, we have our virtual coffee hour after worship, and I invite you to join in via Zoom that we might be connected to one another. And also, I have a report for you that our blood drive was a success, and we thank you, each and every one of you who gave the gift of life, and we ask or we thank those who recruited friends and neighbors. And our health ministries team is seeking to make this a regular, ongoing gift that we offer to the community, a gift of saving lives. So look forward to when those might be in the future and consider giving. Also, we have another CPR class taking place on June 26th. It will be offered with plenty of protections, and so do not fear. There will the class is limited to 12, and this certification, you will get a certificate that you are CPR certified, so please sign up with Health Ministries to do so. Also, our COVID reopening team has discerned that August 1st is our goal to return to in-person worship. So during the month of July, we will have no in-person gatherings, but we will look forward to indoor worship which will be live streamed so that anybody from any place at any time can participate in worship. Vacation Bible School is still looking for volunteers and if you are able to serve August 9th through 13th from 9 to 11 a.m. and willing to participate in the training and the obligations, please let Melissa know. And then finally, this week, Beginning on Thursday and running through Saturday is our California Pacific Annual Conference. Now, the conference will be virtual this year. Certain events of it are, are uh, uh, live streamed. In fact, I think many events of it are live streamed on the CalPAC UMC website for annual conference. So I invite you to participate in that. And just know that Pastor Brandon and myself and four lay people will be actively involved in this Thursday through Saturday. And so if you reach out to one of us and uh, it takes a little bit longer to get a, a response back, uh, please know that that's why I will be traveling to Pasadena on Wednesday morning to set up. I'm a part of that leadership team. And so I may be hard to reach on Wednesday as well, but I am available. So there are many other things. Please stay for the postlude as we scroll the different events by. And now, as you go into the coming week, go strengthened by the grace and love of God, knowing that you are not alone, that temptations may come and offer a sense of gloom, a sense of struggle that we can turn to the Lord our God and we can reach out for professional help and seek oneness with God and one another. Because even in addiction, there is grace. And know that you are not alone on this journey. It is with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that sustains you now and forevermore. Amen.